What's up, Lions? For as little as $5 a month, you can help this show to grow while also getting access to our exclusive Pride content, which includes shows like Conspiracy Corner, Degenerate Gamblers, Special Interviews, Lions of Liberty Roundtables, and much, much more. So check that out. Help us grow at lionsofliberty.com forward slash support. The lawyers thought the therapists were doing the vetting. The therapists thought the lawyers were doing the vetting. Penn State thought that the lawyers had done the vetting, and because they were reputable law firms, they could just just accept it. Well, if you're represented by this law firm, Ross Feller Casey, then you must be re- legitimate, and therefore we don't really need to vet you. Welcome to Felony Friday, a presentation of the Lions of Liberty podcast. Here is your host, John Odermatt. Felons, friends, and freedom lovers, welcome back to another edition of Felony Friday, a weekly show here on the Lions of Liberty podcast. Felony Friday is a show where each and every single episode I focus on exposing injustice in this nation's broken criminal justice system. Felony Friday is only one show on the Lions of Liberty podcast. We have three weekly shows. We start every week with a show hosted by Mark Clare. It's our longest-running program. It's our flagship show. On that show, Mark interviews leaders in the liberty movement. And from time to time, you also host roundtable discussions. It's a great show, and Mark has been killing it, so definitely check that one out. Every Wednesday, we have Electric Liberty Land, hosted by Brian McWilliams, which is your weekly shot of uh, culture, comedy, and liberty. And you can get all three of these shows delivered to your phone, to your listening device. I think everyone listens on a phone now, which is awesome. It's easy. Get it delivered right to that device by subscribing on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Overcast, wherever you get your podcast. Just be sure to subscribe so you don't have to do any work. You just turn your phone on in the morning, it's sitting right there on a Monday, Wednesday, or Friday. You drive to work or drive to do what, whatever it is that you do. Or maybe you listen when you're, uh, I don't know, sitting at work, sitting in your, in your cubicle. It'll just be right there waiting for you. All you got to do is hit the play button. So, Subscribe, and if you don't mind, leave a five-star rating or review for us on iTunes, if you would. Today's episode of Felony Friday, this is a little bit different of an episode. I'm not interviewing a felon. I'm not. Uh, we're not going to be reviewing uh, trending crimes, trending uh, felonies in the news. Instead, we're going to be revisiting a case which we've talked about several times on the Felony Friday show. And with a guest that this will be his fourth appearance on the show. My guest today is John Ziegler. Uh, John Ziegler has dedicated many, 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 many hours and a lot of, a lot of time from his life to investigating the Penn State Jerry Sandusky slash Joe Paterno scandal. And with the Joe Paterno HBO movie coming out, I figured might as well bring John on. I'll introduce John in just a little bit. Before I do that, though, I just want to remind you guys, since this is John's fourth appearance, you know, you don't have to listen to his first three appearances, but if you're interested in this topic, if you really want to understand how this whole thing played out, because this isn't a conspiracy of you know how things went wrong, because John and I don't believe this media, uh, the mainstream narrative around this case, the the same narrative that they followed to make the Joe Paterno movie at HBO. No, this is, case is really an upside-down mix. It's a mess. It's a storm. It's just a disaster of circumstances that came together to form this upside-down scenario where incentives are all backwards. And if you want to understand that, you really got to dig into the details of the case. And one way you can do that is by listening to John's previous three appearances on this program. And you can find those three shows on the show notes page for today's show, which is at lionsofliberty.com slash FF120. So check that out. I'll also be linking to a couple other interviews, some very key interviews, important interviews with shocking information. I'll be linking to those as well on the show notes page. So definitely check that out, lionsofliberty.com slash FF120. Let's get rolling with the show. On today's show, we welcome John Ziegler back for his fourth appearance on Felony Friday. And just some quick background on John. He's a documentary filmmaker, director, author. He has a podcast called The World According to Zig. 
He is a columnist at Mediate, and without a doubt, he's the most knowledgeable person. He's spent the most amount of time talking about this Penn State, Jerry Sandusky, Joe Paterno scandal, which obviously recently in the media, we've heard a lot about it with uh, HBO's movie that came out a couple weeks back. So that is the reason why I wanted to bring John back on the show to talk about this scandal, to talk about new developments, new evidence, a lot of new things happening with this case. So, John, welcome back to Felony Friday. John, always good to talk to you. Really, you know, two reasons. I talked about the first one in the intro there, the Paterno uh, movie that uh, that came out. HBO made it. We can we can touch on that briefly. To be honest, I haven't seen it. I think I, I heard you say that you have seen it. But the second reason we're going to spend you know a lot of the episode talking about is, and probably most of the public has no idea about this, that you and Ralph Cipriano had uh, come together to write an article about this Sandusky scandal, bringing a whole bunch of new evidence to light for Newsweek. And Newsweek uh, trashed the article, didn't publish it. It is still available, though, and we can talk about where people can find that. But I wanted to start off just talking about asking you, first of all, how did this Newsweek uh, situation, how did they approach you, how did this come about, and ultimately, what what ended up happening? Why did it get trashed? Well, like everything in this uh, sad saga, it's a fascinating story. And the reality is probably the opposite of the perception. Uh, I, I understand that you had very limited time in <laughs> describing what happened in your intro, but I, I, I don't think it was a, a particularly just description to say that uh, Newsweek uh, just trashed the story and decided not to run it. This was a five-month process. Uh, this was a situation where we finally got a huge break back in uh, the fall of 2017 when a brand new top editor at Newsweek by the name of Bob Rowe hired Ralph Cipriano to write a cover story about the whole Penn State Paterno Sandusky saga from the perspective of is it possible that everything we think we know is is false? And the reason why this happened was basically two reasons. One – Bob had a background in a very similar story in that he covered the McMartin preschool sex abuse scandal here in California many years ago, which turned out to be a total fraud. And so Bob understood how something like this could happen that we were alleging could occur. And he also had a prior relationship with Ralph Cipriano, knew him, trusted him. And and, and Ralph had kind of educated him about the case. I had brought Ralph into this thing a couple of years ago, something I'm sure he's regretting now. And um, and so because he had worked on some Catholic Church cases, or at least one particular Catholic Church case, which also seemingly turned out to be a fraud. And so um, that was back in October of last year. I, I uh, Ralph brought me on as his co-writer because he knew I had a ton of information, and including this fake accuser, purposely fake accuser, has been doing a sting operation on the primary lawyer for the last three plus years and we were going to combine forces and i flew from los angeles to philadelphia uh, stayed in the uh, airport hotel there for two days and we just went through boxes and boxes of material that ralph had been leaked from the penn state settlements and the free report uh documents directly from the penn state board of trustees was that was that leaked so that was leaked by somebody inside at penn state yeah, this was as inside as you get. This was highly, highly, highly sensitive uh, material, material that very, very few people have seen, um, material that I'm sure the person who leaked it was exceedingly nervous about, <laughs> but felt like uh, it needed to be out there because that person had looked at it and realized, wait a minute, uh, there's a lot of problems here. A lot of very, very big problems going to the core of the entire case. And and it, and that assessment is 100% right. When I, as you know, John, I, I have known for quite a while that Jerry Sandusky was innocent. People who don't know the case think that's crazy and insane. J just to address uh, that for, for a second there, because you know there's people listening that this is the first time they've heard from you. They've heard anything about this case outside of the media narrative. And I know you can't sum up the case in 30 seconds or anything like that, but when you meet someone like that or when you talk to someone like that on the street, because I know you've met Penn Staters and, and changed their mind, um, 
What, what, what do you tell people? What, what, what are the first couple things that, that you tell people who, who approach you with that uh, skepticism? <laughs> well, that's a great question. I kind of go by, you know, like my by feel on how they react to me and where I think the the best uh, the, what but the best strategy is. But in general, if I had to do it in thirty seconds, I would I mean, say take, uh, take longer than thirty seconds. Well, but no, yeah. well, whatever. I mean, I think I th- I'm trying to narrow it down. I mean, to me, the best way to describe this case is that everything is upside down. That uh, w- what you think is up is actually down, and vice versa. The white hats are the black hats and vice versa. And that after seven years, actually more than seven years, seven years of public investigation, 10 years now of, of total investigation by every law enforcement agency imaginable and every media outlet imaginable, uh, there should be O.J. Simpson-like evidence in this case against Jerry Sandusky. And instead, there's nothing. There's nothing literally except the words, the very inconsistent, contradictory words of men, not little boys, men who were paid a total of $118 million for what they said. The case is nonsensical. It, uh, Jerry Sandusky is not capable, I believe, of doing the vast majority of the, the, the most heinous acts that he was accused of physically. He has a characteristic of his genitalia that there's no chance that 30-some men could be intimately familiar with and never mention it. And see, John, that's the key to to why these settlement documents are so important. Now we know all 36 stories. At trial, we only knew eight stories. And there was always this presumption, I think, to a lot of people, well, you can't make up 36 stories. (laughs) Well, for $118 million, you can. <laughs> and um, and it's obvious. When you re- when I read through the settlement documents, and, and I thought I had lost the ability to be shocked in this case. I mean, I, I've been through this for almost every day of my life now for over six years. And I thought, nothing can shock me. Even I, John, was stunned by the utter brazenness and ridiculousness of all the settlement documents, all of them, they were science fiction. And the, and most importantly, what I thought was most important was that two of the six core accusers. See, most people don't understand that when Jerry Sandusky gets arrested and Joe Paterno is fired and the crap hits the fan and everybody now knows Penn State's going to put a you know $100 million on the table, and no one knew how free it was going to be, but it, it was going to be there. There were only six people making an accusation against Jerry Sandusky after a three-year investigation. Well, two of them, two of them, number three and number five, Jason Semesco and Michael Kajak, who was key. Kajak was key in the Spanier trial. What's really important about these two particular settlement stories is that those two guys completely, 100%, change their stories from what they said at trial, which was really very minor uh, abuse, might even only call it grooming uh, type of allegations, no actual sex acts. And then all of a sudden, this is after trial, after they've testified under oath, you know, spoken multiple times to the to lawyers and the prosecution, the defense, been cross-examined, the whole bit. Then after that's done, When it's time to get their money from Penn State, now all of a sudden they're being raped. They're forced into oral sex. It's happening multiple times over an extended period of time. And that's that's a classic situation of, okay, were you lying then or are you lying now? They are effectively admitting to perjury in the trial. And one of my favorite lines out of the thousands that I read in those documents comes from Jason Semesco, number three's attorney where they actually say in the questionnaire, (laughs) very casually, that the full extent of Jason's abuse was not fully elicited at Jerry Sandusky's trial, which was a which is an incredibly benign way of saying, hey, we got a new story for you. Right. (laughs) Because because we have learned through the grapevine that Penn State is paying based upon how bad your abuse was. And uh, and and there's further proof of that, by the way, we have an interview 
a clandestine interview done with Ira Lupert, who was in charge of the, the settlements, the chairman of the Penn State Board of Trustees during a key period of time. And Ira openly admits, openly admits that some of these guys were on the gravy train. Some of them, quote unquote, exaggerated that he settled them just to make sure, you know, for the good of the university. Uh, it's clear he doesn't believe the 1970s accusers. And then we now know the 1970s accusers stories and they're just utterly ridiculous. But so it, it, every level, John, I guess the, if I had to put in one sentence, everything that should be there is not. And a startling amount of information that shouldn't be there is. That's how you know this case is bogus. Not to mention the fact there was no pornography and Daddy Sandusky didn't leave Jerry and Jerry never confessed. I mean, those are the base, these are basic things that happen in all these types of cases. The, the, well, the, the only boy. pornography was on the prosecutor's computers, right? That's what they found. Yeah, and, it, <laughs> what, and what's really amazing, John, is Joe McGettigan, the prosecutor, he just did an interview with some, I don't know, some webcast or something uh, this past week. He's still lying, trying to claim that there was pornography. Now, first of all, why do you need to lie? If you have this, you have the most overwhelming case in history, supposedly, right? Why do you need to lie about that? Why are you so insecure about it? It's it's preposterous. Well, why if if he's saying that? I mean, it, there couldn't have been because it wasn't presented in court. No, exactly. But but John, <laughs> no one, no one who has access, no one who he will do an interview with, has the gumption to say, "Gee, um, why didn't you show any of it at trial? Well, where is this?" Because everyone thinks, and this is one of the keys to how the case has been has not been broken apart has not fallen like a you know the house of cards that it is is that everyone thinks they know the final answer here and so therefore the details don't matter if 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 i'll use this analogy no one likes math or very few people like math right and it, and if you're presented with this incredibly complex math equation that's going to take time and effort to figure out and you think you already know the answer to the equation because everybody's told you what the answer is. How many people are going to bother to check the math? Nobody. Right. I checked the math. And guess what? <laughs> it's not close. It's not close at any level. I mean, and the other analogy I always use is, you know, if you use a mathematical equation, it doesn't matter how many numbers you're multiplying. If one of the numbers is zero, guess what the final result is? Zero. Right. And that's what this is. Zero. This whole case is zero. Nothing happened. I, I liked how you put it. I, I forget you've done so many podcasts and radio interviews recently. I forget which one it was on, but you were talking about exactly what you're talking about now. But th th there are many cracks. There, there's different uh, people coming forward, uh, calling out some of these accusers. There's been, uh, there was a girlfriend of one of the victims you interviewed who said he's a liar. We can talk about this, this case later, this very recent interview that you uh, published on Monday, I believe, about a guy who said one of the victims tried to bribe him by saying he'll buy him a car if he said that Jerry Sandusky tried to kiss him. So th there's these little stories all throughout, and there's, there's probably more people in the woodwork just holding this back. Hopefully, as these things start to as it starts to crater, more of this will come out. You're, you're exactly right about how this case would theoretically fall apart and why it is that I, I was so uh, focused on trying to get the Newsweek story out before Newsweek panicked that literally the last moment. It's important to point out this five month process went all the way to the end. Bob Rowe got fired. So we lost Bob Rowe on, after Super Bowl Sunday. So I thought we were hosed at that point. We still continued on. We were still we were scheduled to be in the magazine the week before the Paterno movie comes out or just big days before the Paterno movie comes out. 20,000 words online, 15,000 words in, on, on, in the magazine. And at the very literally the day before deadline, their lawyer just scared the crap out of everybody. And I don't think it was based in any anything remotely factual or logical. It was pure emotion. I think they someone there got scared that they were gonna, you know, they were gonna be the, the magazine that declared Jerry Sandusky innocent, uh, which they were terrified of. And ironically, I think if our case had not been so strong, <laughs> if we were just, you know, talking about the edges of this case, 
you know, that, you know, maybe some of the settlements are, are bogus or maybe Paterno wasn't culpable. If we were just on the edges, I think they would have probably not panicked and they would have gone for that. But the, the case is so overwhelming. No matter how, they tried so hard, John, to prevent us from saying that Jerry is innocent. Let me give you an example. One of the last versions of the Newsweek story ended with John Snedden, former NCIS federal agent who investigated the case and renewed uh, Graham Spanier's uh, national security clearance. We, we use a quote from him saying that Jerry Sandusky is almost certainly innocent. Now, that is, from a journalistic standpoint, beyond legitimate. I mean, there's there's no nothing remotely questionable about that. He's an expert. He investigated the case and he's expressing his educated opinion. They would not let us use that because they were so terrified. And even without that, as ridiculous as that was, it was so obvious when you read the thing, which you can at framingpaterno.com now, that it's so obvious, even as watered down as it, this version is, that it, he's clearly innocent. And I, that's the irony of this whole thing. If we hadn't had such a strong case, I think Newsweek would have published it. After they put a lot of time, money, and effort into it, um, but it was just too scary. And so, anyway, to your point, had the Newsweek story gone out, I believed by now I would be inundated with similar situations of what occurred Monday. That guy read the story on FramingPaterno.com. He had never even heard of me, I don't believe, until this. And he read about Glenn Neff getting $7 million, and he's like, oh my gosh, I got to tell somebody my Glenn Neff story. Because Glenn Neff had called him a couple of years ago and said, hey, uh, can you tell my lawyer that you saw Jerry Sandusky kiss me when we came over to Jerry's house together? So just, just, just some quick background. Who, who is Glenn Neff? Which, uh, was he a trial accuser? How, how does he Glenn, fit in? Glenn, Glenn Neff is, is not a trial accuser. He is one of what I call the, the Lock Haven Quintet. He's one of five scam artists from Lock Haven, Pennsylvania. Well, that's where Aaron Fisher is from, victim number one. I believe that Lock Haven is the epicenter of this whole thing. I always have. And it's very it's my very strong opinion that, that the four other guys from Lock Haven, Glenn Neff, who is now very close friends with Aaron Fisher, realized that Aaron Fisher was a scam artist. They knew Jerry well enough to know this wasn't true. And if Aaron Fisher could pull it off, they could too. Because they were going to get a lot less scrutiny. Because Aaron Fisher at least, you know, wrote a book, did a TV interview, testified at trial. Glenn Neff just came around in 2016, 2017, way after the fact. Uh, after he had told the guy I interviewed, no, no, this is true. Jerry would never do this. Jerry's an awesome guy. And then all of a sudden, he's he's it's offering him a truck if he'll lie to his lawyer for him, saying that Jerry Sandusky kissed him. And the guy said. Go screw yourself. That never happened. Uh, and he and he, he was stunned. The guy I interviewed named uh, Chad Buzzkirk, who, who we were stunned that, that Glenn never ended up getting anything because he thought, how in the world is Penn State going to pay this fraud anything? Not only did he get paid, he got seven million dollars. Never seven testified. Seven million dollars. Holy shit. Seven million dollars. Never testified at trial. Came forward years later. Years. John. Think about how insane this is. With all the coverage in this case, if you don't, in, in my opinion, if you don't come forward on November 7th or 8th of 2011, I got major questions about you right away. Uh, it, it, anyone who comes forward after Joe Paterno was fired on November 9th, 2011, I'm immediately suspicious of you. Even if even if I back when I thought Jerry Sandusky was guilty, which is what I thought at the beginning of this whole deal, I just presumed it. Um, I would still be suspicious of you because well, they needed some time to meet with their lawyer and a therapist to <laughs> to bring the to, evidence to, out to, to remember <laughs> what exactly right. happened and and why it was that they decided to go to football games with Jerry as a late teenager or bring their children to go see him as or, uh, a young adults or you know every, which is what happened in every single one of these cases. Well, anyway, the point here is. That uh, you know, Glenn Neff had <laughs> Glenn Neff could not be more of a fraud, and he got he didn't just get paid; he got paid seven million dollars. And there's another Lock Haven accuser that members of the board of trustees can't even figure out how this happened because his name is Frankie Probst. He's from Lock Haven. He did a television interview in 2011 after the crap hit the fan. 
on NBC saying, yeah, I, I was very close to Jerry and he's clingy, but he never abused me. And as far as I know, he never abused anybody else. Uh, and um, and Frankie, you know, never said anything again for five years, for five years, through all the media coverage that occurred over that time period. And then all of a sudden, out of the blue, he he files a claim against Penn State about a year before he, he would have been too old for the statute of limitations, which is 30 in the state of Pennsylvania. He files this claim and the claim, John, is preposterous. I've read it. He claims that he was sexually abused up until his senior year in high school. Well, people need to know who Frankie Probst is. Frankie Probst was a star tight end on his high school football team who played college football at two different schools and whose nickname was Frank the Tank. Uh, it, it is, by, by the time he's a junior high school, he could easily beat the living crap out of Jerry Sandusky. Uh, not to mention the idea that you proactively do a national television interview and say nothing happened and then five years later you can get paid is absurd. But here's the kicker. He got paid eight million dollars and and as far as i can tell the board wasn't even informed of it the penn state board of trustees wasn't even informed how did that happen no one knows it was like magic (laughs) i I mean now to me what i didn't john everything about i always say everything about this case is upside down right when before i saw the settlement documents I presumed that the the late stragglers were going to be getting paid, you know, a hundred grand, two hundred grand, just to make them go away, just to clean the whole thing up, right? Kind of, you know, kind of a going out of business sale. This has been the exact opposite. The the, the late guys who are the least credible have been getting the most money. It, 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 everything is upside down. It makes no sense. None. Zero. And the, the five guys from Lockhaven got $35 million combined. Now, you ever been to Lockhaven, Pennsylvania? You know, $35 million could easily buy the entire town several times over. Yeah, it's I mean, a, it's it, just it, a real small, maybe one stoplight town, right? I mean, there's nothing Well, it's there. real small. It's a piece of crap town. Everyone's on drugs. Everyone's on welfare. Uh, it, it, this, this is not a shock to me at all that this is a place – where you would find five guys able to figure out what the scam was and make it work for them, because uh, this is the this is the type of place where the new American dream is to be the victim of a or an alleged victim of somebody with deep pockets, and that's that's what happened. They hit the jackpot in Lock Haven, Pennsylvania. So, h- how many different lawyers have been involved specifically with these settlements? For, well, for that's interesting, know? John. You know, I, I, I think of this case in pods. There were several pods. And I would say, and this is, don't hold me to this, this is an estimate, but it's a pretty good estimate. I would say that at least 30 of the 36 were represented by four lawyers. There were only four lawyers who represented the vast majority. Then you have some stragglers who were clearly, you know, from out of town or out of state or whatever, who were just really trying to jump on the bandwagon. But the, the the vast majority were only represented by four law firms. And, you know, the person um, who was in charge of organizing the settlements, Lupert was, in, I guess, was the board member in charge of the of approving them, I guess. But, you know, uh, Feinberg, the guy who also worked on the 9-11 settlements, he, he's been quoted as saying, I think it's in, our, in the Newsweek version that, that I posted, He's been quoted as saying that, and I'm paraphrasing, but it's a pretty close paraphrase, that they let the lawyers figure out who was going to get how much money. Think about that. They, they, they let the, the lawyers divvy up the money. So, and, and Anthony Lebrano, a Penn State board member who's going off the board, uh, who has been very vocally in, in support of Paterno, and in my opinion, knows that Jerry Sandusky is innocent, but just doesn't have the ball to say it. Publicly, like a lot of others, a lot of board. There's, I could name several board members that believe that Jerry Sandusky is innocent, but don't have the balls. But the reason why I'm mentioning Anthony is that he, he is completely convinced that really the the key decision that any accuser had to make here was what lawyer you were going to use. 
if you had the right lawyer, then you were 90% there. That This was the ultimate good old boys network that happened here. That if you had the right law firm, then you were golden. And because you were you were inherently approved. And one of the more interesting things about our fake accuser that we had do the sting operation with Andrew Shubin for over three years and, and his therapist, Cynthia McNabb, for over three years, is that it was very clear, and we have incontrovertible proof of this, that everybody in this case, John, thought someone else was doing the vetting. The lawyers thought the therapists were doing the vetting. The therapists thought the lawyers were doing the vetting. Penn State thought that the lawyers had done the vetting, and because they were reputable law firms, they could just just accept it. Well, if you're represented by this law firm, Ross Feller Casey, then you must be re- legitimate, and therefore we don't really need to vet you. And And so this is how a scam of this proportion happens, where everybody thinks someone else is doing the vetting, and no one is. So it's a, it's not really a scam. It's just gross incompetence, rampant incompetence across the well, board. Well, eh, it's incompetence, but it's also fear. It's a perfect storm. There's fear. No one wants to question any of these guys because they've been given golden halos by the news media. You know, everyone – I guarantee you that every lawyer that got the cold shoulder or any semblance of a cold shoulder immediately what they did – and this actually happened in a couple of occasions – what they did was they set their client up with an interview in the media, and and that way they got some publicity. Travis Weaver did this. He's a he's a guy who went on NBC, uh, and he ended up getting uh, paid a, uh, a significant amount of money in a very strange way. The, <laughs> conveniently, he changed his date for Penn State so that the insurance company would cover it. And I'm sure that was totally coincidental that his his date changed. So he went he went right into the to the window when Penn State's insurance cover company would cover it and then all of a sudden Penn State stopped fighting him and they gave him the money uh, but he did an interview on NBC uh, there were a couple others that did interviews where they're clearly what they're doing is they're it's a shot across the bow at Penn State that hey we're gonna cause problems here we're gonna gonna show that you guys aren't really uh, getting it that you aren't doing everything you promised to make these victims whole and of course, Penn State, being a liberal academic institution, caved immediately and gave them the money. But they, you know, there was there was no place where they caved more though. When they then in the case of Sebastian Payton, who's victim number nine. Victim number nine came forward after Penn uh, Penn State fired Joe Paterno, and everybody knew there was massive amounts of money on the table, but nobody thought there was. Twenty million dollars, which is what Sebastian Payton ended up getting. Twenty so, million dollars. Sebastian Payton got twenty million dollars, which is, uh, I believe, it's more than twice the, the amount that any other accuser got. Um, and uh, and Sebastian Payton got this money very clearly because two things: one, his lawyers, his lawyers created more paper. In this case, I've seen it myself. I've gone through most of it myself. They created more paper in this case than all the other lawyers combined. And what they did was they went on a full court press. They, these guys, these these jackasses, they put Tim Curley, former Penn State athletic director, who's in horrendous health. They put him under oath for what appeared to be hours doing nothing but asking him questions, horrendous questions, that they knew he could not answer because he was facing criminal charges. So they 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 forced him to sit in a room and take the Fifth Amendment had to be hundreds of times. So these lawyers for Sebastian Payton, they're putting the full court press on, creating all this paper. And in the process of this, they get access to the free documents, the either the core work product of the free report. And I don't I have no knowledge for sure that they actually got those documents, but I do know that almost immediately after they got access to those documents, which none of the other lawyers did, Penn State immediately paid them twice as much, more than twice as much as anybody that anybody else in the case. They got twenty million dollars. Now you do the math, John. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that there's a connection there, that Penn State was terrified that uh, if they got the free documents, that it was going to be leaked and it was going to make everybody look terrible. Now, in which direction, you know, that's open for interpretation. But the reality is that Sebastian Payton 
got paid $20 million, uh, partially because also his abuse was the most horrific. Uh, it was also the most ridiculous because it was occurring as late as 2009. And the things that Sebastian Payton claimed happened are utterly impossible for any male uh, of Jerry's age with a with a 16 year old boy who has not been given alcohol, not been given drugs, not being paid off and is heterosexual. Forget about Jerry's medical issues, which also make the those allegations further impossible. But there's also another interesting thing about Sebastian Payton. So Sebastian Payton, as I said, his lawyers create more paper than every other lawyer in the case combined. And that's not an exaggeration. Yet they never bother to ask for Jerry Sandusky's medical records to find out whether or not their client, who claimed to have blood in his underwear because of unprotected anal rape by Jerry Sandusky, a 40-year pedophile, they never bothered to find out whether Jerry has HIV or any other sexually transmitted disease that their client might be vulnerable to. I wonder why they were never concerned about that. Uh, I think the, uh, the the reason is is rather obvious because this was they they I think they even knew that their client had never actually been anally raped by Jerry Sandusky and Sebastian Payton himself. I mean, and you know people will always rationalize, but there, we have a Facebook post from Sebastian Payton that was posted by him. Uh, of, of, I don't know how many days, but soon after his his claim against Penn State was filed because I know the dates on all that all these claims were filed. And on, on Facebook, he posts, shit, man, I'm balling like a motherfucker money, exclamation point. Now, <laughs> does that sound to you like the reaction of a guy who was really horrifically sexually abused uh, and uh, and his lawyers have just made a claim against Penn State that he he clearly has now been told is going to be worth a lot of money, uh, although I doubt he knew it was going to be worth $20 million at that time. Uh, the reality is that Sebastian Payton was not sexually abused. His story is nonsensical. He was, uh, from people who were at the trial, he was the least credible of all the trial accusers. And he ends up getting twenty million dollars. So, gee, I can't imagine why anyone would lie in this case, John. God, um, unbelievable. So, you, we've talked. To, you've talked a couple times about. You've referenced Jerry Sandusky's medical records, his medical conditions. Um, his medical records were never brought up at his trial. None of it, his, his lawyer didn't reference them. Um, a couple, two questions. So, why didn't his medical records come up at trial? And the second question, people are probably curious, what do these medical records show? Because I believe you've seen them. Why do they show that um, many of the things that he's been accused of are actually impossible? Well, here's what I believe happened with the medical records. So the the crap is hitting the fan. Uh, you know, Jerry's arrested. Joe Paterno's fired. Uh, you know, the world is crashing down. And uh, I, Jerry and or Dottie, uh, say to Joe Amendola, Jerry's attorney, hey, you know, Jerry has very low testosterone and has been in bad health the last few years. Wouldn't that be relevant to these allegations? And, you know, Joe apparently says, yeah, sure. Uh, let me let me see him. So Dottie goes down to Hershey, Pennsylvania to go get the uh, the medical records and she brings them back to Joe Amendola. Now, I'm surmising, but based upon the fact that I know Jerry and Dottie, I know Dottie very well, and I know Joe pretty well, here's what I think happened. I think that the Dottie, who has only ever been with one man uh, in her entire life, and that's Jerry Sandusky, she has, and she's very religious, and she's basically the church lady. I don't think Dottie has, I know she didn't read them, and I don't think she has any concept at all of comparing Jerry to what normal male males would look like or how they would function and or how relevant it would be under the nature of the allegations against him. And so all she does is she just hands him the paper. And so now Joe's got, you know, gets all this paper dumped on him. It's, there's, it's a fairly large amount of paper with a lot of information. And Joe thinks this is all about testosterone levels. And Jerry's testosterone levels are very, very low, like crazy low, which ought to or at least raise questions right off the bat. My guess is that in the chaos, Joe never bothers to read the rest 
of what's in those documents. And, and he isolates it to the testosterone levels. And Jerry and Dottie being the pious people that they are, with, who are not sexual people at all. I, I'm convinced that Jerry is asexual. In fact, there are people who believe a DNA test uh, of him will actually prove that. Uh, they're, they're not even thinking in this way. And so Joe probably never gets to what I think is the most important part, which isn't even having anything to do directly with his sexual function. I believe any rational look at his at his medical records from 2006 to 2008 show that Aaron Fisher and Sebastian Payton, at the least, have to be lying. And if Aaron Fisher is lying, the whole case falls apart because he's the only accuser for two years. But even more important than that, we know for sure that Jerry Sandusky has effectively no testicles and probably has never had uh, anything more than very small testicles. Now, one, that goes to your sexual function. But even more important than that, let's pretend he could magically have sexual function, <laughs> even at an older age. And, and, and the things he was required to do would require extraordinary sexual function, again, with the heterosexual teenage boys who weren't plied with alcohol or drugs or payoffs. But of the 36, this is, again, why the settlement documents are so important, of the 36 guys who got paid, about 30 of them claim some intimate knowledge of Jerry sexually. And you mean to tell me that one of the 30 <laughs> with hundreds and hundreds, I believe that Ralph estimated that according to the settlement documents, we have at least 600 allegations of direct sexual acts that not in not one of those 30 some guys ever mentioned yeah by the way this uh, this this jackass who's been abusing me has almost no testicles no one's ever never mentioned that no no one's ever I, used that as an identifier i mean that's especially if, if they were looking to prove that it was true i mean how 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 better to to prove that exactly well this was a key part of the michael jackson case if you remember was he had a distinguishing characteristic on his genitalia the, it is it is completely ridiculous. Any male will tell you that given the allocations here that that not one of these guys ever mentioned, oh, by the way, Jerry has virtually no testicles. That would be the first thing you would say, especially with money on the line, because these guys were looking for ways to prove they were abused. Right. That would be a golden ticket. And no one mentions it. No one. And the reason why they didn't mention it is because. None of this ever actually happened. Oh, man. So it's, it's hard to even know what direction to go in here. We've covered so much information already. Um, you know, I, I should say this. People who are listening to this interview, and this maybe this is your first time hearing from John Ziegler, hearing uh, you know, a contradictory side of this case uh, really that really attacks the, the media narrative that, that's been built up. Go to Framing Paterno. If, if you're interested, which you should be, if you've listened to this far, you should be pretty damn interested in what he's talking about. Go to Framing Paterno, which is John's website, and there is more, there's more information there. I, I don't know. For, you, you could probably keep yourself busy for, for a year at least. So check that out. Check out – I know John's done recent interviews on Glenn Beck and a bunch of other different programs. So check all those interviews out. Definitely check out the interview which published Monday – on John's podcast that we just talked about with uh, Chad Buskirk. Um, that's the guy he was detailing that, that Glenn Neff trying to, uh, to bribe him. There's not better evidence than, than that out there to, to prove that, that this guy's lying, that so many of these accusers are, all of these accusers are, well, are lying. And it's are we going to, are we going to, are we going to talk about the fake accuser? Yeah. Let's, let's go into that now. Let's go into the fake accuser. Yeah, because one of the things that Newsweek was so very excited about until like the last day <laughs> when all of a sudden they, they hit the panic button. So how, they, how did the fake accuser come about? This is a, 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 a guy that just approached you and said he was going through the process or, or what happened there? Well, <laughs> it was bizarre as everything about this case is. but And I, I don't want to get into too many details right now uh, – for, for a number of reasons, but basically here's what happened. The, um, there was a guy who went, was a second mile, uh, charity alumni, I guess you call him, uh, who, uh, had gone through the program. He was, um, at this point he was 31 years old, unfortunately, which was a year older than, or two years, a year or two older than he should have been. 
Uh, otherwise, this might have turned out very differently. But he. Um, but well, he why do you say that? Just to well, because the, the statute of limitations is thirty in in Pennsylvania, so that was critical in how this whole thing went down. But anyway, here's the here's the the story. So this is a guy who had been convinced that Jerry was innocent. His mother worked for the Second Mile Charity. She was convinced that Jerry is innocent. This person went to the trial. He literally spoke to Matt Sandusky on that infamous day when Matt Sandusky uh, sat next to Dottie Sandusky in the family section of the uh, the courtroom on the first day of testimony. And he confronted Matt and got Matt to tell him that this was all baloney. This is all not true. This is not who his dad is. These guys are lying. Those are Those are almost direct quotes from Matt to the fake accuser. So at that point, the fake accuser knew for sure that this was all a fraud, but he didn't know what to do. And he, and he waited quite a long time before I think he just got desperate. And, I mean, because, you know, after the free report and the, the sanctions and everything else, just one thing after another, it, it became clear the system was not going to work. Right. And you needed to do something dramatic to try to, to save this. So at a certain point, he decided that he was going to go to Andrew Shubin, who had represented nine very key accusers, including the Mike McQuarrie accuser, Alan Myers, and Matt Sandusky, and he was going to claim to be a victim. And he went to Andrew Shubin with no preparation at all. I mean, hilariously so. And he gave him a story that was ridiculous even by Sandusky accusers. Uh, standards, and he told them that Jerry had abused him behind Joe Paterno's house in the park there, behind Joe Paterno's house. Uh, and, um, and and Shubin didn't, you know, didn't object. He uh, embraced him uh, as a victim. But what he did next was really quite startling. He, in the second meeting, he sat him down, and he said, okay, let's review your story. And he, looking at a laptop, or a desktop computer. I don't know if it was a laptop or desktop, but looking at a computer, he is clearly going through bullet points with the fake accuser, the purposely fake accuser, and he proceeds to tell him what his story is, as if he's reviewing it from their first meeting. Except, John, it's not his story. In fact, it's not even close to his story. He has created a new timeline, He's created a new location. He's he's created him an intricate story of him telling people at Penn State what had happened and Penn State ignoring him. Uh, and and then in the, the the funniest part about this whole deal is he actually references the story in the park, and he says to the the fake accuser, "We'll talk about that later." Like the, like like dismissing like this. You know, look, your story. We're not going with that. And it was very obvious to the fake accuser that this whole thing was a wink, wink, nod, nod game that Shubin was playing. And let's be clear, Shubin is the whole case, okay? If, if you believe that Andrew Shubin was manipulating accusers, you cannot believe the case against Jerry Sandusky, and you cannot believe the case against Penn State, because he is at the epicenter of all of it, all of it. And there's so many things. That, I mean, this went so this started a three year plus odyssey. The fake accuser went to a, the a Shubin's therapist, Th- Cynthia McNabb, for what he estimates to be a hundred therapy sessions, a hundred. And then he gets at a certain point. Who, he gets, who paid for those therapy sessions? Uh, Penn State. Apparently, Penn State's insurance company did. Wow. Um, and and at, at a certain point. He gets diagnosed by a psychotherapist with post-traumatic stress disorder, which, not coincidentally, John, according to the settlement documents I've seen, almost every single one of Shubin's clients was magically diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder, which is really their – that's the more politically correct way of them trying to claim repressed memory therapy. Repressed memory therapy has been debunked, so now they go to – post-traumatic stress disorder as an explanation for why you forgot that you were abused by Jerry Sandusky. Uh, And of course, all of this is completely fraudulent. I mean, none of it was real. And 
incredibly long story short, I mean, there's so many things about this I could tell you, but how it ends is, you know, Newsweek wanted to make this the star attraction, and they recommended to us that that uh, that I you know that I tell the fake accuser to stop this thing to to end it, and so in a, in the process of trying to get closure, and again, it's important to point out people wonder why didn't he get paid? It was so easy to get paid. Well, the fake accuser, as I said, was outside the statute of limitations, and Shubin kept delaying because the state of Pennsylvania has been has been uh, debating in the legislature a change to the statute of limitations for the last several years because of the Catholic Church case. And well, they've decided effectively they're not going to do that. They're going to do it for criminal cases, but not for civil cases. So civilly, Shubin felt like there was nothing that he could do for the fake accuser because Penn State the board had changed, their policy had changed, and they weren't basically, they weren't giving away the fort as much anymore. It was basically, they had already made last call, and it was too late. But get this, at their last meeting, Shubin tells the fake accuser, look, I can't file a claim because you're outside the statute of limitations, but I'm going to put you in touch with the state attorney general's office, and Anthony Sassano, who was the lead detective on the Sandusky case, and and I'm going to get in touch actually with a with a prosecutor in the Spaniard case, Mike Dicka's daughter, uh, and I'm going to tell them about you, and I'm going to I'm going to connect you guys for the purpose of you filing a criminal complaint against Jerry Sandusky, and with the implication being that if you file a criminal case against Jerry Sandusky and it creates enough publicity and maybe even gets into trial, Penn State may may just want this to go away and may decide to pay you some money to make it go away. And this is all stemming from the case that Andrew Shubin, from the circumstances that Andrew Shubin fabricated himself, right? Yes, 100%. And, you know, and we have documents, we have letters, we have emails from Andrew Shubin documenting this. We have emails from the attorney general's office to the fake accuser trying to make contact with him. I mean, this is all proven beyond any shadow of a doubt. And uh, again, in a weird way, I think our evidence was too strong. And Newsweek, Newsweek thought this was this was the centerpiece of the whole thing. And then they they got they got scared um, because it's you know it's it's incredibly explosive stuff. And there's no other way to, you know there's no other way to interpret it all other than this whole thing was a scam. Why, again, do, you not, th- why do you think not, Newsweek wanted make to sure, make? Can I just make sure? Yeah, go ahead. I, I, this is not a conspiracy. I'm, I, 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 having seen the documentation, having reviewed the, the extensive incontrovertible intro, in, in tr- proof that the fake accuser has, I believe that Andrew Shubin thinks that Jerry Sandusky is a child molester. But he also thinks that it's that makes it okay for him to lie, cheat, and steal to do anything possible in order for him to make money out of it and to punish Penn State. And by the way, I also think, and the fake accuser believes, that a large part of what's motivating Andrew Shubin is not just the money. It's just that, that, it's that he is a University of Pitt graduate and hates Penn State, as insane as that is. Um, so the, the Penn State-Pitt rivalry may have played a very key role in all of this, uh, but not in a conspiratorial way. This was, this was everybody uh, invested in their own self-interest and oftentimes thinking they were doing the right thing, and and um, and that's a very dangerous deal. When people think they're doing the right thing, I think they actually sometimes are more willing to do things that are wrong than they would be otherwise because they rationalize it. And that's, I think, what was happening here to a large degree. So just one more question on that fake accuser. You kept, say, you kept saying that Newsweek wanted to make him the center of the story, why mm-hmm. would they want to do that? I mean, with so much other moving parts and you know evidence that pokes holes in this false narrative, why would they want to focus on the false well, accuser? I think it's it's the Shazam factor. It it was the exclusivity factor. I, I mean, it's um, I mean it's pretty powerful stuff. I mean, you, you oh it you is got, for sure. You got you got a fake accuser who for three plus years is embraced by the number one lawyer and therapist in the case, and then and then gets uh, get gets connected to the attorney general's office to the for the purpose of filing a criminal complaint <laughs> against Jerry Sandusky when it's all fake, and you've got proof that they changed his story. 
Uh, that's not just changed, by the way, radically altered. I mean, made up, I should say. They made it up. They made up his story for him. And so all of this, um, you know, I think they thought was that that was going to be the, the star attraction. And, um, and you know, it, it should have been. I mean, it's it's <laughs> but it, it, I understand your point. You You know all the details, but I think to the. One of the things that this story lacks, John, see, the other side can put their version in a tweet, right? Jerry right. Sinus was a monster pedophile and Penn State, Joe Paterno and the administrators covered it up. Bam. We we don't have a one line headline uh, that can combat that. Um, however, you know, the fake accuser comes pretty darn close <laughs> to, uh, in a situation that would get people's attention. Well, I think there's so, two, yeah, I think the fake accuser does, but also the other thing that comes close to that is Jerry Sandusky, not even medically, it's not even medically possible for him to have uh, done this. Well, abuse. see, the, the problem with that is all, everyone will always, uh, in, in this case, the burden of proof is so insanely high on my end. Not on the other end. <laughs> on the other end, there's no burden of proof. But on my end, I mean, you, you, I would basically – here's what I would have to do. I would have to produce photos that Jerry Zanusky has no genitalia. <laughs> then, then maybe <laughs> then maybe I would I'd be able to get somewhere. But people will always rationalize, oh, well, maybe he was using Viagra. Okay, well, wait a minute. Hold on. First of all, if he was using Viagra, that would require a prescription. You don't think that the prosecution would have had that? You would have. You don't think that would have been uh, clear uh, evidence brought forward at trial? Uh, no, it doesn't exist because it didn't happen. If he was buying it on the black market, you don't think that that someone would have sto- sold their story of uh, to a tabloid or something of having sold Jerry Sadowski uh, uh, sexual performing enhancing drugs. Uh, so he could molest boys. I mean, there's, there's these are things that we would know about if they were real, but they, were, they happened, but they didn't. By the way, not one of the 36 accusers ever mentions, yeah, oh, Jerry had to take his pill before he could attack me. I mean, not none of that. It's it's so the the problem is that you know the we 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 might get a headline if Jerry ever gets this DNA test that a lot of people believe will show that he has a genetic, I don't know if you would call it a deformity, I guess it's a deformity, uh, that proves that he never really went through puberty. And that therefore, all these other things that that appear to be problems in his medical records uh, are backed up by genetics. That, I think, might uh, open up some minds. But unfortunately... Uh, you know, the system is so rigged against him and his lawyers are so incompetent. They thought they were going to be able to get the DNA test. It requires his blood. Uh, we have his hair, um, but apparently that's not good enough. And I have no trust of, of anybody involved in this to get that done. In fact, in fact, Ralph told Ralph Cipriano told me, oh, we're going to get a DNA test done from Jerry. I laughed at him. I said, are you are you kidding me? Do you have no idea the incompetence and the morons and the, and the and how rigged against Jerry this whole system is. There is no way we're getting a DNA test for Jerry Sandusky before this story comes out. And you know, I everyone always says I'm a pessimist, and oh, I, just tell me when I'm wrong, John. Just tell me when I'm wrong, because <laughs> it hasn't happened often, unfortunately. So I mean, I know one of the reasons that you. You know, you wanted to get this Newsweek article up, and you've been doing this this round of interviews, as I think you mentioned, to give yourself some closure on this case. Because, God, it's been how many years has it been that you've been researching well, and, and pouring yourself into this? It's been on and off for uh, at least uh, six years. Um, or, uh, I, I I wouldn't say full time for six years, but. It's been it's been close, and I've been, I've given up. I you know it's not just that I've wanted to give up. I actually have given up. I gave up before the Newsweek piece thing happened. I was ready to toss in the towel, and then the the Newsweek thing happened. I said, okay, well, I got to give it one last try here. Um, no, nobody would like to get out of this more than I would. Uh, it's important to point out, I am the only person who has looked at this case. And come to a different conclusion than I had in a way that is against my own self-interest. I, I know of no one else who has done that. 
everybody else, everybody else who has looked at this case, their public position is based 100% in their own self-interest. No one has come to a conclusion against their own self-interest. No one, except me. And I also happen to know the most about the case. So you, so you figure out what, what the relevance of that is. It, 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 ought to, it ought to be relevant to people that the guy who knows the most about the case is also the only person who came to a conclusion that's against his own self-interest. And I knew it. John, I, I, when I started to suspect that Jerry Sandusky was innocent, I didn't go, oh, my God, this is awesome. <laughs> I, I spent at least a year or two before Dottie Sandusky and I went on the Today Show together and declared that Jerry was innocent. I spent a good solid year trying to disprove my own inclinations, and I couldn't do it. I couldn't come close, and everything that's happened since then – and just further substantiates that. If, if I was wrong, John, I wouldn't be able to come up with one one thousandth of the information and the interviews that I have in this environment. In this toxic of an environment, people would not be coming to me on a se- semi regular basis with major stories like the guy who got offered the the bribe of a truck for making up a story. That would not be happening. It would just would not be happening. If this story was remotely real and it's not real, it's a, it's a fraud, all of it. So, so what's next for this story? I mean, what, what, what's, I guess two things, what's next for, for you with this story? Are you going to try to step away? And is there any way that Jerry Sandusky gets another trial, gets some kind of justice here? Um, I'm hoping to be able to step away. Um, you know, there's always, you know, somebody asked me, me the other day about a, doing a documentary uh, a guy who's a documentary filmmaker he wants to do one I tried to dissuade him from doing it because this 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 thing is as lost as could be um, but I'm always I'm always uh, cognizant of the fact that you know the, if Jerry lives long enough it is theoretically possible for the climate to change uh, and so you know, I want to at least allow that possibility. Uh, legally, there's no hope in Pennsylvania. Zero. Uh, the, the only hope for Jerry Sandusky is to live long enough to get this into a federal court where a federal court will look at simply the due process aspect of this from a constitutional standpoint and realize that this was a joke. I mean, Jerry Sandusky could be the most guilty man on the planet, and his trial was a joke from um, uh, dozens of different perspectives, and I think a federal judge would would see that and wouldn't care about what people in Pennsylvania say or what the media say, and and might actually do something. But will Jerry still be alive long enough for that to happen? I I don't know. He's in better, a much better health and a much better situation than he was a couple of years ago. He's in a new prison, but um, you know, I, I don't I don't think this is ever going to be fixed. Um, no, none of the accusers are ever going to turn because they're literally invested. Their their money is invested. They they're probably worried about you know potential criminal charges if they admitted that they lied. Um, none of them are going to do it. They, they they're all scumbags to begin with. I mean, so that we're we're dealing with a pool of thirty six scumbags, and so we're asking for someone in that pool of thirty six scumbags, <laughs> ideally one of the eight trial accusers, for it really to matter. You know, no one in that pool of scumbags is suddenly going to grow a conscience and do something against their own self-interest. Uh, I mean, I guess there's the theoretical possibility as some of them get older and have kids and, and you know, maybe they're, they grow some morals, but I, I doubt it. And, um, and so this is going to be one of those things that this is going to be the biggest story ever that just falls through the cracks. It's going to it's going to fall into a black hole and, you know, it'll be on framing dot com, the truth, but no one will care. I, I could I mean, I could see with some of these accusers um, blowing through their money, you know, wasting it all, ending up dead broke in the same position they were beforehand. And then I, I don't know, maybe coming forward and exposing it all, trying to write a book about it, blaming, you know, blaming lawyers or blaming who the heck even knows? That's possible, John. I, I think that's possible. But Jerry will be dead by then. And uh, once Jerry's dead, there's really no 
there's no hook for this. Um, so, you know, look, I mean, is it possible that 20 years from now there, there might be a, a different view of this case? Yeah, but then no one will give a shit. <laughs> so, I mean, um, you know, it doesn't matter because Jerry will be long dead and Joe Paterno will be long dead. And, and you know, the other thing, you know, about preserving Paterno's legacy, um, you know, <laughs> Joe Paterno last won a national championship in 1986. We're, we're, we're quickly getting to the point where, you know, most people <laughs> who are alive don't remember that. Um, and, and those people who do remember are going to be continuing to die at, a, at a, uh, an increasing clip. And so there, it really is one of those things where it's just going to kind of fade into into an oblivion. And I, you know, I, it's a shame. It's a tragedy, but I, you know, psychologically I have tried to deal with this, not by rationalizing, although maybe some people think of this as rationalizing, but in a weird way, um, I've come to despise everybody in this case, uh, with a great passion because I know them very well. And, and so in a weird way, um, even though they're getting punished for all the wrong things, it, it, it's hard for me to, to really pinpoint who got punished that didn't deserve to be punished. Because these were all people who were fucking morons and uh, and cowards. And, uh, and you know, and frankly, um, you know, I, I include a large, not all, obviously. Some Penn Staters have been awesome in all this. But I think the Penn State community deserves an enormous amount of uh, blame for this and criticism. And the paternal family has disgraced themselves. Uh, so, you know, Joe, I'm, I'm glad Joe's dead. So he didn't have to see this, this disgrace, um, that his two sons are Scott and Jay. Um, and you know, I, I don't even, you know, it, ironically enough, there, of all the people I've dealt with in this case, um, there are only, only two people who I have greater respect for today than I did when the case started. Uh, and they would be, uh, Franco Harris and Jerry Sandusky. <laughs> Um, um, as insane as that sounds to people who don't know the case. Um, and I don't like Jerry. I think he's a moron. Um, and I think he deserves a lot of blame for how this all went down. But uh, he, what he's been able to endure is amazing. And I have an incredible amount of respect for that. Um, and Franco's been great. Um, but everybody else, every single other person I've dealt with, I think less of them today sometimes exceedingly less than I did at the beginning. And so it's really kind of hard for me to look at it and go, gee, I really feel bad for this person. <laughs> the only the only bad part is they got blamed for the wrong stuff. Uh, but they, it's not that they're blameless, though. So Speaking of Franco Harris, he has taken a hit um, for, for taking the stance he has, especially in Pittsburgh. I know a lot of University of Pittsburgh uh, Steelers fans who you mentioned Franco's name, and they, they scoff at him. They think he's crazy and mentally ill so franco franco is one of the wisest uh people that i that i know um now we don't always agree and he doesn't agree with everything everything about this case uh, with me uh i do think that he, he's moved in that direction over the last few years but um but he is um he's a very smart guy and ironically as a kid i i, I hated franco harris i was an eagles fan and Thought, you know, thought he was a wimp for running for running out of bounds all the time uh, for the Steelers. But um, the the reality is that he's a very wise person and uh, not perfect. No one is perfect. I'm hardly perfect. I've made a ton of mistakes in all this. But my my larger point is that um, you know this ha this is the greatest injustice that I've ever encountered or heard of in the modern era. Um, but, you know, a lot of the people who got punished, in a weird way, they kind of deserved it. So that's 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 how I keep my sanity, <laughs> to the extent that I keep it, John. <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's, it's an upside-down case, so that's an upside-down way to keep your sanity. But if it works for you, stick with it. Just, just one more <laughs> question. I think what, one way to blow this case open, or to at least get it a lot more, a lot more people looking at it, would be to get on Joe Rogan's podcast. If Joe invited you on, would you go? 
I'll go on anybody's podcast that, that asks me legitimate questions, but Joe Rogan's never going to have me on his podcast. He, he, I, he might. He might. I mean, I, I would. I would just say to people listening to this right now, if you've listened all the, all the way through this far, then obviously you're you're probably on board and probably questioning questioning this case, questioning the the media narrative. Go ahead, tweet this interview to Joe Rogan and ask ask Joe to to bring John Ziegler on his podcast. He, I could definitely see it happening. Not going to happen, John. I can assure you. Well, I'm not going to bet. I'm not going to bet money on it. But well, no, because <laughs> Joe, Joe Rogan's already invested in in one of the worst narratives in this entire case. I mean, he he, he and Alex Jones think that uh, Jerry Sandusky was running a uh, a pedophilia syndicate out of Penn State. I mean, he's he's as far off the reservation on this thing as anybody I know. He's a nut job. Well, I so. <laughs> I, I I think I actually know the interview you're talking about. I heard that that was the Joe Rogan 911 show where they all got high as shit and were talking about all kinds of stuff. And Alex Jones went on a, a rant about that. And I, I don't think Joe Rogan put much thought into it, just kind of you know following along with it. But he, he's a guy that would I, I think you know take his time to to ask questions and let you explain yourself. So it could happen. I I would be happy to do it. Uh, I did Jay Moore's podcast for two and a half hours, uh, so I'd be happy to do Joe Rogan's, but I'm not holding my breath. <laughs> right, <laughs> and I'm, I'm not saying it's definitely going to happen or, or bet money on it, but it would be uh, would be a great thing to see. So, John, I, I want to thank you so much again for coming on the show, for everything you do, for you know s- spending some time to uh, to talk with the uh, Felony Friday audience, and uh, you know, I would say keep up the fight, and I, I hope you do. But at the same time, I completely understand if you if you back away and and let this thing lie. Well, John, I do appreciate your support, and thanks for caring about the truth. And uh, make sure everyone checks out everything at framingpaterno.com. dot com. All right, thank you, John. Take care, John. Well, guys, I hope you enjoyed that interview today with John Ziegler. You know, I know there's a lot of people who follow all of John's work and listen to everything that he does, all of his interviews, um, all of his appearances on radio. To those of you that this is the first time listening to the Lions of Liberty podcast, to the Felony Friday show, I thank you. I thank you for tuning in, and I thank you for pursuing truth and justice in this case. Please share this interview with your network, share it with your friends, share it with your enemies, share it with people who agree with you, Share it with people who want justice in this Jerry Sandusky case and share it with people, especially people who are putting up blinders and refuse to accept the truth, refuse to look into uh, the circumstances of this case to pursue truth. You know, uh, just a couple of thoughts on this. And guys, I'm not going to I'm not going to go on very long here because, I, as you can tell, I'm fighting a bit of a, a cold or something. I, I live in live in Pennsylvania. And uh, as anyone who lives in the Northeast right now knows the uh, weather has been crazy. It has been super weird. It'll go from 60, 70 one day down into the 30s, snow in the next, then back up, then back down. And that's just not good for, for anybody. And it's not good for, uh, apparently, my uh, nasal cavities because I'm just stuffed up. I don't feel sick, but I don't know if I have allergies or, or what the heck's going on. But it's weird. Anyway, that, that aside, I do want to just pose a couple questions here because if you've listened this long you probably care about this case. You probably um, care about justice in this case. You understand that there is an injustice at hand, a massive injustice, and there is massive fraud being perpetrated, especially on the taxpayers of Pennsylvania and against many individuals who've had their names completely tarnished and completely ruined. So do you care about truth? And are you willing to hold an unpopular opinion? Because if you care about truth... In this case, like anything in life, a lot of the times the truth is very unpopular. And there are very, very few people who, after finding out an unpopular truth, are willing to stick a flag in the ground and and defend it and fight for it and prove it, prove it to others and share it with others. If you're willing to do that, I applaud you. If you're not... Go screw yourself because you are no better. You're no better than people who are taking the other narrative, taking the opposing narrative here, which is so unbelievably absurd. If anyone, if any of these people actually took a minute to think about this narrative, think about the accusations brought against 
Jerry Sandusky, and Joe Paterno and looked at the individual stories, even looking at a handful of them, and looking at how these stories have evolved and changed over time when more money was put on the table. If anybody with a sense, with a, with a fraction bit of integrity would look at that, I mean, they have to understand that it's not possible. So if you're willing to um, listen to this entire podcast, listen to most of John Ziegler's work, and then not defend it and not share it with other people, screw you. I mean, seriously, screw you. So I'm sorry. Maybe that's not the best way to uh, to get new audience members, but wake up, guys. Wake up. The only way that the narrative will be corrected in this case, and Jerry Sandusky will get a new trial, maybe hopefully at the in the federal courts, and the only way for Joe Paterno's name to be restored as a man of integrity, which he is, which he was, is for this complete bullshit narrative to be thrown entirely out because it's it's crap. It's garbage. And to bring the people who are taking advantage of the system that's put in place, this garbage uh, settlement system that Penn State has put in place, ramp it with fraud, just a complete joke. The only way for those people to be held accountable is for people who understand the truth to share it and educate other people. And I'm just going to leave it at that, guys. One more quick note, and I'll, I'll let this be. If you're still listening and you want to support this show, if you want to support the work we do here, you can join what we call the Lions of Liberty Pride. Now, there's a couple different levels you can join the Pride at. You can join at uh, just a $5 level. You get access to our bonus content, our private Facebook group. That's fantastic. We love that. If you want to contribute more, 10 15 25 we have escalations there where you get more perks. At the ten dollars, you get some free stuff, free T-shirts, stuff like that. Fifteen, you get uh, more free stuff, and you get our uh, Monday through Friday uh, news links that are sent out. Different bunch of different categories: politics, um, criminal justice reform, foreign policy, mainstream media news, uh, culture news, all kinds of stuff. So. You get that uh, every Monday through Friday for $15 and up. So at 25 you get that. But at 25 you also get a monthly conference call with us. So be sure to check that out. And you can join the Pride by going to lionsofliberty.com slash support. Just going to leave it right there, guys. Thank you so much for listening. This is John Odermatt signing off. Always remember to keep your head up. And the fire is a liberty burner.